Um, but here's what I would tell you. Today, uh, I may or may not, just depends. Um, I'm, I have, uh, I'm a little sick, so if I need something to drink, I'll have to do that since I ran out of my water. And, uh, but look, we're in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and I just want you to find it. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, obviously, we're in verse 1. My name is Pete. I'm one of the student ministers here. Uh, Clayton's running around here somewhere. And uh, if you are a guest with us today, uh, man, we're so thankful that you're here. I would love the opportunity to talk with you or meet with you after this, uh, Clayton as well. Uh, so if you brought a friend or something like that or you know someone's new, a lot of times people run up and introduce them to us, and I would appreciate that. That would be great. All right, so Ephesians chapter 2, we are in a series called Creepy, and that's because uh, probably something that I thought of, but the idea was there are things that creep in. Every single believer has issues and things that confront them. Matter of fact, one of the things that confronts most believers is doubt. For some people, it's doubt about their faith. For some people, it's self-doubt in their ability. Uh, there's insecurity. Uh, for some people, uh, one of the things that creep into their life as believers is gossip. Uh, for some people, you can see up there, are things like fear. I have people that text me or people that write to me and say, I, even though I'm a believer in Christ, I struggle with these things and they're afraid of things. And so these are real things that creep in into the life of real believers. Well, today's thing that we're going to talk about is something that sometimes can get a little misused. Um, it deals with self-worth which actually has to do kind of with value and the way that we see ourselves. So self-worth, um, it's a kind of a, a big deal um, uh, for our generation. It used to seem like that nobody ever really focused on that. But your generation seems to really focus on who am I and do I matter and, and, do, and do I have a purpose? And, and if I don't, what does that mean? Uh, your, your generation seems to do a lot of comparison and things like that. So um, a couple of statistics that I would give you, they're not fun statistics, but most of you know what I do. And so today, um, uh, you, I think y'all know, most of you know that I'm a counselor on the side. And uh, today um, is like many of my days. I probably average in a week probably anywhere between two and three students that are walking through suicidal ideation or self-harm. Uh, I do that pretty frequently, and today was no exception. And so today, uh, uh, a young lady was brought to me, and, um, and we sit down, and she's real timid and quiet. And so we begin to talk, and they tell me that, um, and I'm sure y'all know this, but the school has a big computer, and if you write certain things on it, that it's called gaggle, whatever, it's going to alert somebody and I got alerted that this particular individual had written that they wanted to kill themselves. And, uh, and so they were brought to me, and so we had a conversation. And in that conversation, uh, I listened to her, and I was like, what, what is it? What's going on? Like, whatever. And, and this is a little bit of what she had to say. You don't know her. You know what school I'm at or anything like that. So um, what they said was, you know, and this is a middle schooler, so a seventh grader, just simply saying, man, you know, I, um, I have a friend, and we've been friends since elementary school, and she's mad at me, and she said she doesn't want to be my friend anymore, and she told this boy that she was going to say, I'm going to tell him what you said, and so I want to kill myself. And I'm like, you're in middle school, you're in seventh grade, a friend today told you that they didn't want to talk to you, and they're going to tell some random boy some random story, and you decide, I probably want to check out of this life. And when I think about that, I, just to be honest, it's just, I, I think about this generation and how quickly people respond because of the way people, they perceive people feel about them or, or when it doesn't go their way. So let me just give you a couple of statistics, right? So since 2008, the suicide rate has doubled between 13 and 14 years old. Um, it said that there's a significant increase of depression, anxiety, and mental illness with 27% increase in anxiety and a 24% increase in depression. 
25% of teens are diagnosed with a mental health condition. 28% have already received mental health treatment. 11.5% experience major severe depression. Suicide is the leading cause of death for 13 and 14 year olds. And it's the second leading cause of death for those between the ages of 10 to 24. As I think about these statistics, I'm also reminded of one of the statistics that says that Christians, Christians that live for God, it's been a recent, a recent study, a large global study, Christians that live for God, claim to know God, and attend church faithfully, are significantly less likely to experience depression or anxiety of those of their peer counterparts who do not claim to know God or do not go to church. And so I want to talk to you a little bit today about self-worth. And what I want to talk about self-worth about is just a little bit about kind of how we receive and perceive information, kind of where those things come from. So maybe on your slide in a little bit, there's a couple of places where we get it. There's number one is there's communication, right? There's communication. One of the stats said that the reason that the, 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 the level of depression and anxiety has risen so high, it is directly correlated to social media. So with the rise of social media, you have the rise of suicidal ideation, depression, and anxiety. So communication, our worth is often based on what people say about us. The other one is comparison. How we see ourselves next to others, their achievements, their successes. Every single day that you exist, you look at a screen that tells you something about yourself simply by looking at other people's lives. Her dress was better, although you did win and you looked awesome. Her dress was better, you know, her hair was better, his life is better, their family is better. Like, and we look at that and we think those things. And then finally, connections. Who we know and who we hang out with. These are all the things or some of the things that directly affect our self-concept, our self-esteem, uh, our, our uh, security or our insecurities. They affect our self-worth. And so I just want to share at least biblically some things that I think that we need to know about self and about self-worth. Because actually, biblically, the Bible says something about you. It says one thing's for sure, you matter. You matter because it says that you were created in the image and the likeness of the creator. So you matter. It says literally that you were formed and knitted in your mother's womb with God's intention. It says that he knew you before the foundation of the world. So for all of those reasons, him forming you, you being in his image and his likeness, him knowing your life, him planning where you would be and where you would live and what it would be like, all of that God is, is, is uh, intricately involved in your life. So you matter. But still, when we talk about self-worth, I want to give us a biblical perspective of that. So if you would be with me, so Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Did I say 1? I meant to say Ephesians chapter 2. All right. So I need to tell you this, right, as I go to read. Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2 are not really two separate chapters. They are in your Bible, but they, they, they lead into one another. And so I want to kind of explain how that works, that, that people put chapters so you could follow. But they lead, and he's already told us that in love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters. And he walks through that a little bit, and then he says this. I'm talking about all of this stuff that God has done for you. And then here's what he says in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, and by you, he means you, you who claim to be believers, you that know Jesus Christ, you that would call yourselves Christians, you that made a decision to follow him. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live and when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now in work and those who are disobedient. 
All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we, that's us, were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One of the first points that I want you to know, and and a lot of people don't like maybe the the way this is phrased or said, but when we talk about self-worth, I would just communicate what the Bible says. You are not worthy... I'm sorry, you are worthy, (laughs) my bad, you are worthy because he loves you. You are not loved because you are worthy. You are worthy because he loves you. You are not loved because you are worthy. I want you to look at the Bible's perspective of it. He says, before you ever knew me, I was thinking about you. Matter of fact, the chapter before that, he said, I predestined, I predetermined in love that you and those that would know me and that I would know that I would love them. I did that before the foundation of the world. But before all of that, I knew who you would be and where you would be, how you would act, how you would rebel. I did that, and in who I am, I determined to love you. And the Bible says, as he was predetermining that, you were dead in your sin. You followed your desires. You chased after evil things. You followed the the spirit of the culture and the air, and you pursued it. And even in that, because of his great love, he predetermined, destined, and said, I am going to love them no matter what. And so you weren't worthy, and therefore you're loved. You're loved from him makes you worthy. Matter of fact, I had a... um, I have a, a sister, and I, I know, have most of you met some of my sisters? Whatever. So I have two sisters. I have, um, I have um, uh, an older sister, Susanna, that's probably the one you met, and then I have a middle sister, Caroline, and she's the one that used to beat me up all the time, right? Are y'all familiar with this? And she used to beat me up well. Like, somebody was asking me, like, beat me up a lot. But one of the things uh, that she had is she had this, this rabbit fur, um, this, this old dead rabbit fur. And, um, and I, I mean, we all hated it, but she wore, like had it around. And so it looked like a dead rabbit, I guess. And, uh, it was gray and white and she would walk around and hold it and pet it like my process, you know, and she would, she would walk around with it and, and just hold it and, and love on it. And I was always like, come on, man. And she, whatever. And, but every night she had it. Every road trip we took, she was my, you know, right? She was walking around with it. And if she wasn't, if she was doing anything else, she was like rubbing it and touching it. And we're all, man, whatever. And here's the thing. That thing was gross, and it, it really was. It had been everywhere. There were probably several times that I stole it and did something mean to it. Um, it was gross. It didn't cost anything. It had all kind of imperfections. But she loved it. And it wasn't valuable at all. It wasn't valuable because it didn't cost anything. And it wasn't valuable because it just, it was beat up and it was some dead piece of fur. But it was valuable because she loved it. And so I want you to understand something. It meant it had no purpose. It had no meaning. It had no value. But because she loved it, it had purpose and it had meaning and it had value. And the Bible says for us, the idea is in our sin, we really have nothing to offer God. But that it says that, that when Christ was dying, 
that he demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And that sin idea is that you weren't neutral about God. The sin idea is that you hated God. The sin idea is that you, were, you followed everything but God. Matter of fact, since he predetermined to love you, he not only knew what you would be like before him, he knew all the dirty, filthy sin you would do after knowing him, and he still determined to love you. And that will never change. Because he not only determined to love you, it's not only in his nature that he's love, he is love. And he set all of his sights on you to love you no matter what. And therefore, you're worthy because he loves you. I love it when I think about Paul and he, he sits in a prison and you wonder about his circumstance and how things weren't working out and he's trying, to, he's trying to share the gospel with the world and nothing's working out for him and he's probably gonna be killed soon and all of these different things and all he can say is, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor death nor anything else in all creation can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He's convinced. Why? Because Paul was something special. He said, man, I consider all that trash, all that rubbish from just knowing Christ and the fact that he knows me. And so you are worthy because he loves you not because you are worthy. So what does that mean? Here's what it says. Here's the good one. Is that your worth is given, not earned. Your worth is given, not earned. Now for many of us, like our natural, just who we are, our, our competitiveness or our desire to want to earn things kind of steps in the way. But the Bible says that's not what you want. Because if you could earn it, then you would never deserve it. Because it removes who God is and that he's holy and that he's separate from us. And that if you ever, ever thought at any place that you could earn it, then you'll never deserve it. Because you don't deserve it. There's nothing you can do. And so that's why he says, man, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. But why is that so good? Here's the deal. Because if you could earn it, you would lose it. And the grace and the worth that he gives you, you can't earn. It's a gift. And so by simply receiving Christ, he gives value to your life. And since you didn't earn it, means you never deserved it. Since you didn't earn it, you can't lose it. And this is for all of us that would say, man, my life in Christ has never looked the way that I want it to look. I just don't know that God's going to do anything with me. I don't know that God can do anything with me. God can do anything in anybody at any time because he is the one that makes you worthy. And so I think a lot of times as believers, we receive Christ and then we think for some reason, now it's up to us to navigate this perfect life and it's gonna look a certain way. And he wants you to understand the worthiness you received at salvation is the worthiness that he continues to give you every single day of your life because he's purposed himself to you to be worthy by his love. So you've never walked out of your salvation. You've never walked away so far that he can't redeem you. You've never walked away that he can't use you. You in every way are loved by him and he is ready to use you at any point because you are worthy. Why? Because of you, no, because of him. And since he doesn't change, the worth remains. You know, one of the last things I think are important is he says this. He says that you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That word, there is, that word there is that you are his masterpiece. Think about that. Before you started, it said you were dead in your trespasses. That you were in every way against God. In every way, there was nothing that you did or could do to please God. 
But by the time he's done with you, you are his masterpiece. You know, I, um, I think what's important as I look at it and as I was kind of thinking about your worth is purposeful. Your worth is purposeful. God didn't just give you all of these things so that you could feel good about yourself. Although you should feel great about what God has done in your life. But he's extended grace and he's extended mercy and he's extended love and he's extended worth that you might extend that to others. And the best part about it is you don't have to explain to anyone about what you used to be once God transforms you. Let me give you an example, or at least I have a student that uh, recently gave his life to Christ this past year. He came over to my house, uh, and it was late, and he said, I don't, I don't know what to do. He said, I'm a Christian now, and I know that I am, but everybody knows what I've done. What do I do? How, how, do I, how do I tell them that I'm different? I'm like, tell them you're different. <laughs> He's like, how do I tell them that I've come to Christ? Tell them you came to Christ. How do I, I was like, you don't owe them anything. I've heard Clayton and many people say this before, that you know, God doesn't, you know, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call, right? The, you don't owe anybody anything. And so there's some of us in here that pre-Christian, you think you've lost the opportunity and the witness and the ability to communicate to anyone about your new faith. But you weren't worthy before. There was nothing that you've done. The worthiness comes from him. And so you were made purposeful because he made you that way. You don't owe anybody anything. You don't have to remain in what you used to do or what you used to be. And so I was like, man, you just need to realize God is the one that has made you worth. Yeah, but I don't think I can tell them this because I did this. But God makes you worthy. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. They all, but God makes you worthy. Yeah, but here's the thing. After I came to Christ, I still did. But God makes you worthy. Yeah, but you don't understand, man. Like, there were some struggles I had, and most of my friends, but God makes you worthy. But you don't understand, I struggle to read my Bible, and I don't have these things, and everybody knows, and they saw me on social media, and I post, but God makes you worthy. He does that. You have never operated out of your own worthiness, ever. Not in Christianity. In Christianity, you operate out of the fact that God makes you worthy. And he calls you sons and daughters and his masterpiece. So I don't know who it is in this room that struggles with the idea I've made these mistakes and God can't use me, or I've done so much bad that if I became a Christian now, everybody thought I was one, and, and now if I become one, I'm gonna mess. You're not messing any of God's plan up. He's predetermined to love those he knows, and he's not gonna change his mind. The question is, would you accept the fact that you're not worthy that the fact is that you, you are a sinner. That you, you did rebel against God. That you shouldn't be used. But by his grace, he is asking you to come to him. And everybody comes to the same place. It's all the same level at the foot of the cross. Nobody got in because they were good. If you would say, I need that Jesus, I need to be reminded 
that he can still use me. I'm going to encourage you to take the time right now as we go to pray to say, God, I realize that I've been thinking it's about me. It's about what I've done. It's about the mistakes I've made. I've got to, I've got to dot every I. I've got to cross every T. I have, but, but God, you made me worthy. And if I just receive that and accept that, I can walk in the freedom and the forgiveness and the power that you give me to repent and walk free and walk powerful and walk used. You know, one of the, one of the last things I'll share, I think this is true for Christians. You know, one of the comments I made was, if you earned it, you would never deserve it. And I think we have way too many Christians that think they deserved it. And so you never communicate it. If you would just realize how undeserving you were, so that when the person walks into this room or they walk into the school and you think, not them, just remember that if it wasn't because God predetermining his love towards you, it would have been not you. And can we just get this heart and this attitude that we are just vessels that God just chooses to use because he makes us worthy, because he loves us and we don't deserve it? So we're going to go out in the freedom and the forgiveness and be used by him and extend that to everybody who doesn't deserve it? So let me just pray for some of you and then we can go to our groups and talk. Father, we love you. And we're so thankful and we're so grateful that every one of us in this room who is unworthy can find forgiveness and a savior and a new life with purpose and meaning. We can find that in you. And I pray for anyone in this room that they know they've messed up badly. They know people know about it. And so they will not walk in the freedom and the forgiveness that you offer. I pray that today that, Father, they would realize they can reach out to you anytime, anywhere, and find forgiveness, and immediately, Lord God, you can use them right where they are. I pray for those that don't know you but sit in this room and pretend that they do, and they don't know how to say in front of everyone, I never knew him, but I need to be a Christian. I pray that you would give them the faith and the boldness And maybe some of the the confidence to walk up to someone and say that they need you because their life looks nothing like you. And for my Christians in here, I pray. I pray for that, that spirit that we have where we're conceited or confident in our own abilities or believe that somehow, some way, we deserve something that others don't deserve. I pray that we would confess that and realize that we were unworthy. And because you extended your love to us, that we can extend that to others. I pray as they go to group, Lord God, I pray that their groups are authentic and real and that your Holy Spirit has his way and that people are drawn to your son Jesus and that you're glorified by it. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, y'all can head out the group.